Uh, I am uh, Chief Sales Hacker, VP of Sales, uh, Master of All I See and Domain over at Zinbit. Uh, Zinbit is a sales enablement platform solution. And um, if you're interested in what we do, we have a booth outside that you go ahead and take a look. Just look for the orange and lime green carpeting. And that's what we're going to be on over there, right? There. We're right there serving the food. So that usually works out real well. Phil Dixon is here as well. Uh, he is the CEO of Zinbit. And we're here to present to you um, what we're calling Houdini Admin, the art of making Salesforce invisible to increase adoption. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb. Who here? thinks that adoption is an issue with Salesforce in your user communities. Okay, yeah, it's a little bit going out on a little bit of a limb. So, so what, what we hope to go ahead and provide you here is kind of a look at test what and how you can go ahead with your, oh, let me keep on going out, in, in and out, that you can go and work with your users uh, in order to go ahead and make, uh, make Salesforce invisible. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. So first off, um, I wanted to go ahead and thank everyone, uh, the sponsors of this event. It's fantastic uh, that they were able to go ahead and become platinum sponsors and provide our, cap or, you know, our ability to go ahead and present to you here. Um, I know it is the last day of the month, and uh, I know you probably are uh, either have or are going to send your email to your salespeople to update Salesforce because you're going to run the forecast later on tonight, the first thing on Monday, right? And I understand. So as you're doing it, as you're putting together that email, we are going to give you a couple quick ideas on things you can put in that email to make it more effective. Um, the first thing is you can uh, revoke their special parking places. I think if they don't update Salesforce on time, you'll go ahead and take that salesperson of the month parking space right away from them. Uh, don't expense lunches anymore. Tell them that's going to stop, and salespeople will come running to go ahead and update Salesforce for you. Cancel that President's Club trip, or at least threaten it, and we'll see how they're doing. And then when all else fails, you can go ahead and threaten to call their mother to say, that, you know, you need to go ahead and start. And we say this with a little bit of levity, but, you know, I've been a salesperson for over 25 years, and I've used a whole host of different CRMs. And the issue has always been, I've been a bane to the existence of my, of my CRM administrators for years. Uh, because I'm the guy that you have to chase down in order to enter the data. And then when I became a sales manager and a VP of sales, I was the guy you had the meetings with to chase down my people in order to get them updates, up, uh, update their CRM. So I really understand, and we understand as an organization, what you guys go through on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly basis when you're working with your end users and attempting to show them exactly how valuable Salesforce can be if they just utilize it the way you're asking them to. So I wanted to talk a little bit here about what we've defined as the truth of CRM. This is from an article, May 1st, 2016. Um, typically, it says Howard Berg, president of Berkeley Enterprise, is saying field sales forces are independent. They don't adopt sales or, or CRM very easy. Who would agree with that? That's difficult for, to go ahead and have salespeople uh, CRM. Well, I told a little fib. That's not from an article in 2016. It's an article from 2001. And there's the link at the bottom, and you can go ahead. They actually use Blockbuster as a case study. So that's how old the article is. But what it hopefully illustrates is that what you're going through with, with adoption of your CRM is nothing new. If you look at the last 13 to 15 years, the, sale, the CRM, and this is across all CRMs, not just Salesforce, not just you know, those that will not be named. It's that, the, it's that these specific uh, uh, failure rates are, you know, come from a multitude of different sources. And failure is specifically defined as the executive organization, the leadership feels that CRM is ineffective. And when you average all this out, since the turn of the century, you're looking at in, you know, a 54%, one out of every two CRMs is qualified by executives as a failure. Now, this is not because of the application or the platform or the widget doesn't work or something else. This is just the way it has been for a great long period of time. And if you take a look at your people, your organizations, whether they be salespeople, service people, accounting, uh, whomever is utilizing the CRM, these are primarily the top reasons why they dislike the CRM. And again, this is across all CRMs, but I wanted to bring this data over to you. If you take a look at those top three, 
over 75% of CRM users are actually having an issue using the CRM. It's too time consuming. It's difficult to learn. It doesn't perform well for me. And again, what happens when you, do, when you kind of deconstruct this data, what you'll find is that it's not specifically poor performance because the app doesn't work or the site doesn't work or something else. The poor performance is it doesn't help me in, the, in my day-to-day -day job. It isn't where I need to be. I have to build up that alt-tab muscle over and over and over again. Whatever application I'm in, I have to alt-tab over to the CRM in order to enter data. So the brutal truth, what we talk about when we talk about CRM, is that really since the turn of the century, the way end users feel about CRM hasn't changed. And I'm going to go out on a limb here. It's regardless of the technology advancement, regardless of the years of best practices, all of the conferences since, the, since 2000, 2001, how to help with CRM, how to make CRM more affordable, how to, do, how to, make, how to get better benefit from it, adoption is still. One of, the, one, one, one of the biggest uh, uh, impedances to getting the things that you want done. And when it comes, being quite honest, as CRM admins, as Salesforce admins, where you really want to spend the, your time is in that little area called dashboarding and reporting and providing that capability, the cool stuff, the neat stuff that people can utilize. And you get really excited, a feature comes out, a new widget comes out, and you can do that. And then at the end of the day, at the end of the month and the quarter, you're again chasing down people to get that data in so you can provide value to them. So briefly, let's talk about how CRM is used. And this was, these are surveys done with CRM users specifically about how they're utilizing the CRMs. 27% use it to enter data uh, to satisfy reporting. And that satisfy reporting is a very important uh, uh, suffix there. They're not entering data to make it better for them, their, their pipeline to be, to, to have quicker pipeline velocity. They're not customer success people entering data to service the customer better. They're entering data because there's an arbitrary rule that's, that's reporting up to someone that's saying they need to satisfy it. And that's the, that's kind of the feeling they get when they're entering that data. They take a look and they enter the same information, the same date, not the same date, the same data, the same data in multiple systems. So what they're entering in their contacts and their email application, they're also entering in Salesforce and contacts. What they're entering in SharePoint, they're also entering in, in the CRM. So they're entering data in two different places or multiple different places. And service orgs, the big thing for them is duplicate data entry. Here's my trouble ticketing system, here's my this, here's my that. Oh, by the way, here's my service stuff that I need to enter, it's the information here. So there's multiple, multiple ways. So that's how they're physically using it. And is it any wonder when this is what their experiences are as users, they come back and they say, ah, it's too time consuming. It's poor performance, it doesn't work for me. And that's uh, actually a Blue, with, a Blue Wolf study, now part of IBM, the state of Salesforce. So on LinkedIn, I wrote a article about six or seven months back about why your CRM is killing you. And basically it was about, uh, you could take a look at it if you want, look me up on LinkedIn there, but it specifically was about is that what, what do end users, what do users think of CRM? And while my, I thought my insight was pretty valuable, what was really important to me and what was really valuable was the feedback I got from CRM users. We're in the, when, you, when, when you have people saying, you know what, it's not that we don't care, it's just that we don't want to duplicate records. We don't want to enter data in, in two different places. You have people saying, it doesn't add value and my management is unlikely to read it. That's, that's not a true, that may not be a true statement, but that's how they feel. It's clogging the sales process. It's not, it, it doesn't allow me to actualize my, my pipeline and, and make sales. And then after you have enough of this, and enough for uh, many years of this, you get people like this, where they think the CRM is a morgue. And it's just full of a bunch of dead bodies and dead corpses and bad contact records and bad opportunities and unclosed things and it doesn't help me at all. And to distill it down is I really liked this, uh, this, uh, this from this particular user. He said, I feel like CRM is, it's, it's it's free labor, it's performed by sales reps. It's like, I'm out there selling 
Why am I here going into this application and entering this data? Now again, this is their insight to you that I provide you here. This does not mean it's true, does not mean I agree. But the fact of the matter is the reality, perception is reality. And if this is the perception that your end user community has about entering data into CRM, into your sales force, no, no amount of training, of kickoffs, or anything else like that, special yeah. events are going to go ahead and provide you of adoption that you so desperately want because this is how they feel about it. People don't, I've been in sales for, like I said, a long time. People don't buy because the spreadsheet tells them, even though they say it is, people buy because they feel good about it. It's an emotional thing. And if you need your salespeople, your service people, your customer success to buy into adoption into Salesforce, you have to realize that this is where they're coming from emotionally. So that's great, Derek. What's the answer? So the answer is you have multiple users, multiple user profiles out there. And I call them profiles, but they're really user types. Multiple user types. They may be sales. They may be service. They may be uh, tech support. They may be IT. A number of different types of user profiles that you have. The way we believe, and it sounds really simple, but it's a lot harder than it sounds, is to focus on the user. And what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean by creating a culture that focuses on the needs, the day-to-day -day needs of the user, and construct a user experience built on that. Um, when you go, and this is this comes, Salesforce has bought you know very well into this, is it? And they and they look at this and you know and they say you know it, people will have ownership of the solution you're providing them if they feel it addresses their core needs. If you design a process to get data into a system, if my main job responsibility isn't getting data into the system, I'm going to push back on that naturally. That's only human, that's only, you know, I'm, this is 6,000 years of human experience here. This is what people do. So when we design these processes, if we can take a look, if we can turn that, that laser beam onto what we're focusing for the user, we can attempt to go ahead and do that. Well, that's great strategy, Derek, but how about tactically? What works there? Well, this is what we believe uh, as an organization, and what I personally believe is what people miss when they're designing CRM interface, when they're designing CRM experience for their user community. And then we're going to go into how each of these look here. The first is, is that CRM users need to feel successful in the use of their technology. And you probably have experienced this from a number of different rollouts of widgets and applications and things like that. If they don't feel, if they try it once and it doesn't work, I mean, if they try it once and it doesn't work, it's kind of like that's, you're fighting, a, you're fighting a losing battle. And especially with salespeople. I know we're, we're special snowflakes, but that's how, that's how we feel. If it doesn't work easy for me, I don't want to use it. And when I do use it, I want to feel successful in using it. I want to have a feeling that I've actually accomplished something not so much to enter data from my boss. I want to feel, uh, I want to feel confident that I've, I've used the technology and it's helping me in my day-to-day -day process. The next thing we feel is that they understand on an intellectual level that adoption is critical for the success or failure of the CRM, but the success or failure of the CRM is not a metric that they measure themselves on. They have no skin in the game when it comes to the success of the CRM because they're trying to do a job, whether it be they're answering chats on technical support, whether they're doing forecasts or billing and accounting, whether they're selling stuff and things for you. They're looking at the CRM as a tool, either necessary or unnecessary, but they have no skin in the game when it comes to the success or failure of it. And again, that's an emotional perception is reality, and that's their perception. We have found that the less they actually have to, quote unquote, use the CRM, the higher the level of adoption. When you're able to institute applications, you experience that keeps them away from building up that alt tab muscle, all of a sudden data, the data validity goes up, your reports look better, your forecasts are more accurate,
because the data going in is good. It's like the old, anal you know, it's the old computing analogy, garbage in, garbage out. Well, if you can make the garbage coming in invisible and valuable and make it very, very, you know, make it so that it's not a lot of work for me to get it in there, I'll go ahead and provide that to do it. And then the last one is to look at, as a user, as a user profile, where are your users spending most of their time? What are your salespeople, what applications, where are they spending most of their time? Whether you're a customer success, whether you're sales, whether you're accounting, looking at where they're spending most of their time will provide you valuable information and valuable data into how you can go ahead and maximize uh, and provide the capabilities of Salesforce within that particular workflow. Because that's truly what it is. It's, it's, it's when someone is doing a job, let's say I'm an accountant and I'm doing a job, and I'm in my accounting application or I'm in Excel. Anything that takes me out of those applications, out of that area, is increased work for me. Because my job is to balance the books. My job is to create the forecast. My job is to go ahead and pay the bills. My job isn't then to go ahead and then enter data about it. And so that's the feeling. So if you can concentrate CRM, concentrate Salesforce into where they already are working, you'll have a much greater opportunity for uh, adoption. So we're going to go ahead and look here at a couple different work habits of four different user profiles. We're going to look at sales rep, and we're going to look at what they do, how they work, and provide you a case study of an organization that has provided a solution that helps with that. And then we're going to do the same for a field sales rep, a support rep, and accounting and billing agent. This is by no means an all-encompassing, this is the way to do it as far as the case studies we're showing you. What we hope this accomplishes is gives you the idea that by looking at each individual user profile and, and, and distilling it down to their day-to-day -day job, what they do, it will assist you and your organization when you're trying to devise strategies and, and more importantly, tactics on how to get them up, you know, adopting, you know, adopting and using Salesforce in their day-to-day. -day. So let's take a look at John. Uh, good looking guy. Uh, John is a sales force or is a sales rep. And uh, he doesn't always act, enter his activities in Salesforce. And that is all. That's, that's true. We, I know I'm not telling any tales at school. Not, I'm not splitting atoms up here. I mean, this is, this is how most salespeople feel. So the fact is, is that John worries about his pipeline, he worries about his forecast, he worries about closing his opportunities. He's paid commission, he's paid bonus, he's paid, that's what he lives, breathes, and dies on. He is part of this 85% of Salesforce users that identify data entry as the worst part of their job. You go out from today, walk onto your sales floor on Monday, ask people what the worst part of their job is, invariably it will be data entry because salespeople are normally people people and they like dealing with people. And the antithesis of people is a computer screen. And that's exactly what they feel. So, if they can get by with doing the bare minimum, they will do it. And you've probably noticed that when you've changed KPIs, when you've changed required fields within Salesforce, that when you make something required, they'll fill it in to the bare minimum. If you say, we need uh, if your sales uh, leaders say, we need five meetings a week uh, entered into Salesforce for everybody to be at quota or whatever, this is, this is our new KPI, automagically, in the next couple of weeks, you have five meetings a week every rep. Doesn't help the pipeline at all. Doesn't, doesn't increase the revenue at all. But we got those meetings now. So what reps are going to do is they're going to go ahead and do the bare minimum to, if they can get away with it. So let's take a look at John's workflow. This is what we think John's workflow looks like. He's got a new opportunity, he wants to respond to a client, he sets a meeting, he calls a sales engineer, hey, we gotta do a demo for this guy, um, we gotta follow up the task. So this is kind of, when, when John walks in in the morning and he looks at his email, this is what he gets. He gets his lead and he works through this process. But then we overlay what we're asking them to do within Salesforce. 
Well, now we have to go ahead and utilize all of these different systems in order to send a quote, request a meeting, add an opportunity, add the products to the opportunity, all that stuff that we're asking him to do. John was just an email. And really the most important thing you can see for John's workflow is not over here. It's right here. John wants to do what he needs to do for this op so he can go on to the next one. He doesn't want to spend a lot of time, a lot of energy updating his system. So what invariably happens is that John waits until Friday to enter his CRM data, or he doesn't. He says he waits till Friday, and then he lets Friday go, and then Monday goes, and oh, I was busy, and I'll get on that right now, and thanks for the email, and this is what happens. So Ring Central is an application that embeds itself. It's a, it's, it's a voice over IP application, but, it, but, the, but the thing we like about it, and the thing we think works well with people like John in this particular case study is that it embeds itself in the process of what he's doing. John gets an email from a client, he picks up the phone, he needs to talk to them about something. He wants to set a demo, he wants to pitch, he wants to do something else like that. So what Ring Central does is it says, hey, you're in Salesforce already looking up the number, why don't you just dial from there? And not only do you dial from there, you actually enter in your description, enter your data, do everything under that particular record that you need done while you're talking to him on your headset or on your phone. John's already gonna be on the phone. That's part of his job. So we bring Salesforce to him where he is, and he's more likely to go ahead and, and update it and, and add that information. And you can go ahead and with this particular, and there's other app, but this particular application, you can pre-program and create fields and whatever needs to be done within that particular record allows you to do that. But you know, rather than just saying this is, this is the way to document calls, what we're saying is this is the way to look at the sales profile, the salesperson profile. There are multiple steps, whether it be phone, email, whether they're you know, in their quote process, in their presentation process, that you can engage and look for ways to bring the CRM to them in their process. And what you'll find is when you institute technology and a process that goes to where they are, invariably adoption will increase. And if you give them this type of tool, just specifically if you're tracking phone calls, this type of tool will enable you to track X percentage more calls than you're tracking right now. Now, is that important? Is that valuable to you? That depends upon your business model and, what, and, and how you guys prospect, how your organizations prospect and what you guys do. But in the end of the day, what this, what this hopefully illustrates is the way in which you can bring Salesforce directly to where a person is working and then allow them to go ahead and do their job and use it invisibly. So next step is here's Salesforce user Judy, and she's a mobile rep. And she's out there in the field. And she's on her iPad and her iPhone and um, all her other i things. And she's out there and she's talking to people, she's delivering cupcakes, she's doing demos, she's doing all this other stuff. She's hard to get a hold of as far as updating her data. Because she's like, well, I'm sitting here in the airport or I'm in the hotel and I'm gonna update my data there. She, you're always, you're waiting for her and she's waiting to enter her CRM data mobily, right? She's also part of this 55% that report that they either access or want to access applications through smartphones or tablets, because that's how they live, that's how they work. They're out there in the field. They no longer want to have to be in the car in the parking lot, lift up the laptop, and enter data like that. They want to be able to do it right there in the waiting room, in the vestibule, as they're walking the, I don't know how many other football fields long the uh, Atlanta airport is, but while they're, in, while they're walking that airport, they want to be able to enter that data, right? So. You take a look at her work habits, she's again, like John, she's doing all this stuff, but she's doing it mobily. And you need her to create opportunities, to file emails, to go ahead and update information, to feed her pipeline, to make her forecast number. And she's all got to do everything mobily. So it's kind of like, you know, she's doing everything John is doing, but she's doing it go, walking backwards. 
you know, just like dancing. So she, we put a bigger burden on Judy in order to do that. So customer case study here is we take a look at something like Zenbit. And what that does is from a mobile interface, it provides you the capability to look at email and then do everything you need to do mobily within Salesforce. So if you need to go ahead and either file the email or look at Salesforce, go into your opportunity, edit your opportunity, you maybe want to go in there and file an, uh, file an email, log a call, create a meeting, all of this stuff that you're trying to track within Salesforce and that you're requiring them to do when they're in the office, alt tabbing and enter the information. Providing Judy or someone like her the ability to do that mobily will exponentially rise or raise your level. Again, because where you're going is she's already going to be on that phone. That's how she works. So you bring CRM over to her. And she's invariably going to be an email, her most used app anyways. So why don't you bring it on over into that way as well. And again, when you, it, when you have Judy working in an app that she normally works in and gives, you, gives her the capability to do the things you're asking her to do, the ability for those things to get done is going to rise again exponentially. So that's Judy. So now we have Salesforce user Cindy. And Cindy is customer success, customer support, right? And she's the one who deals with all the people I sell, and then I go away, do my other stuff, and then she is responsible for following up, making sure things are installed, trouble tickets, all that other stuff. And again, Cindy is the support rep, and she is supposed to help clients, and she helps clients with issues, provides best service. Again, she is one of these people that when asked, she's part of that 85%, that user profile 85%, where they can't stand doing the data entry. Where, they, where they're saying, I'm in a chat, I'm on a phone, I'm in a web share with a client, I'm trying to fix their problem, and I can't be, you know, and now after I fix my problem and my phone is ringing and my email box is filling up, now you want me to go back into Salesforce and enter all the data that I just so again, Cindy is saying, I would love to help, but I'm busy doing all these other things. If you could bring that to me where I am, it would be a great benefit. And if you take a look at Cindy's work habit, there she is. There it's like, hey, I've got a problem. My widget isn't working. My, my delivery wasn't delivered. And she takes the call, or she routes the email, she's doing on chat, she's creating the ticket editing the ticket, all, all the stuff that she's doing, and then we're asking her to do all that, and then update a lot of that information after you're done with that call. And it's no wonder she says the worst part of her job is data entry. So a little company called Salesforce is looking at ways to go ahead and fix that, and that's through Live Agent. So when I'm in a chat with a particular, I'm a customer success rep and someone comes next to me via chat and says, hey, I've got questions about my widget or I've got something else. Not only can I go ahead and get all that information and provide them that information through the chat application, but I can also access information, update information in Salesforce while I'm doing it. And if I've enabled it correctly, I can have my supervisor monitoring my chats. So if I'm just about to get off that chat, they can say, hey, don't forget to update sell the guy or gal that's on the phone. Don't forget to go and tell them about the promo, tell them about everything else. So it's real-time interaction, utilizing Salesforce as the conduit with your customer success people and your, and your end users that they're servicing. And then they're even pushing it in a mobile application. So we can provide that capability to chat and to interact with those people. Now we at Zinbit have a customer success team that works in chat and giving, and giving customer and giving our people the capability to go ahead and, and interact this way with the CRM is invaluable to them. Just the simple fact that I'm able to go into a Salesforce record and just see all of the chats my customer success team has had with this particular client, before I pick up the phone and call them to renew, it's invaluable to me as a sales rep. That excites me as somebody who lives on a quota and who's actually trying to sell. And for Cindy's case, the ability to go ahead and provide that level of customer success 
with not, with, with, without having to then go ahead, end the call, and then doing other data entry is invaluable to her as well. So again, she's going to be in chat anyways. So let's go ahead and bring the CRM, let's bring Salesforce to her and her team so they can go ahead and utilize it that way. So meet Salesforce user Mark. He's in the accounting department. And he is sitting there and he works in one of two applications. He works in Excel and then he works in the CRM. And so his workflow, he's also one of these. He's responsible for budgeting, forecasts, projections, compensation, calculations. He's my best friend on the 15th of the month. But he's responsible for that. He's also, again, another one of these user profiles that say data entry is the worst part of their job. They just don't like doing it. So what does is, what is Mark's workflow look like? Mark's workflow is incredibly complex. That's it. Well, no, wait. He's also in the CRM. And this is proportional. They are in that application with pivot tables and other types of sheets and workbooks and everything else like that. And they are doing, they're, like I said, the only people that understand really how that application works. And they're able to utilize it. And when we put CRM there for them, they look at it as a wall they've got to jump over to get to that other application. I'm in CRM all the, or I'm in Excel, I'm in my spreadsheets, that's where I live and breathe. And now you're asking me again to alt-tab into something else to go ahead and update information. So if you take a look at Aptis and their ex-author application, this is again bringing Salesforce where the end user is working. And where are they working? They're in Excel. So rather than tell Mark, I'm going to make you do all this great stuff in your pivot tables or everything else, and then you're going to have to alt-tab and do some data entry, or we're going to create this kind of update process, batch kind of thing where we're going to go ahead and update some of this data for you, a solution like this actually interjects Salesforce directly within the spreadsheet functionality, allowing people to go ahead and utilize, Mark to utilize those spreadsheets, those forecast projections, and as soon as the forecast proje projection is changed in the spreadsheet that they love to work in, it automatically gets updated to Salesforce. Invisibly. Mark is updating Salesforce and he doesn't even know it. Because you brought that functionality to where they're working. And again, there's multiple different products. And so as you think in your own organizations, the, type, the different types of user profiles, how are people working and what are they working in? Try then to identify how you can assist and then look at technologies, look at solutions, Look, go within the Salesforce user communities and ask other ad admins, what have you done? How have you, you know, done this yourself? What kind of things have you guys created? I know you guys spend, we're in these user communities a lot as well, spend a lot of time in there asking each other questions. There's a reason for that. There's a reason for organizations like this, events like this, is to have that mind share. And what we're saying is, what really helps is to understand that everybody has specific user profiles that are utilizing Salesforce, and not all are the same. You know, your salespeople may work a little differently than your salespeople, but as long as you're developing the user experience for each of your internal organizations, your adoption levels are going to rise. So what happens when you focus on the user? Well, when the user is central to whatever experience you're trying to create, and yes, data entry is the end result and getting good data into Salesforce is the end result, but the experience is created with the user in mind. So whether it's about mapping or updating uh, forecasts or contacts or calendaring or syncing or whatever they're doing, when you're focusing on the user, that's when you get the happy user. Because you're making their need, you're, you're making that whole process that they disdain, that they push back against, invisible to them. They don't want to update Salesforce. Let, them, let, let that automatically happen via email, via Excel, via the phone call that they're making. Where the work is done. 
Now, one of these ways that we feel it's an email, and whatever email application you're using, whether you're using Outlook for Mac or Outlook or Gmail or mobile, people across all parts of the organization utilize email a great deal, probably more than probably any single application. So uh, when you take a look at salespeople, they're spending an average time of 45 minutes a day in the CRM, and they're four hours a day in email. So specifically for that profile, it begs the question, shouldn't that access to the CRM be in the app that they spend most of the time in? And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, I asked that question and a customer, not a customer, an actual person uh, who wasn't a customer came on and said, yeah, he, he had never thought about how to integrate CRM with his, with his email. And he figured out how that was pretty important. So it's all about kind of adding value. And in the modern sales process, it's really changed. 15, 20 years ago when I was selling something to someone, it was all about what my thing did my widget did, how it helped, how it saved money, how it made you money. Everybody's widget either makes money, saves money, does something for everybody. Where the value really is, it's in the customer's buying process. What we're identifying in sales is that we need to create ways, not just to get, allow our customers to buy our things, but to make it easy to buy our things. And so if you can devise whatever solution that you're looking at, um, that will go ahead and provide a, something to make it very easy uh, for the rep to utilize the CRM, you're going to see that exponential growth and adoption. It used to be, this is how we would go ahead and, you know, sales reps, even, you know, most CRM users, is that, you know, this is, we're holding this out here, we're putting that carrot in front of you. If you up update the CRM, we're going to gamify it. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to run a contest. We're going to, there's multiple things that we're, you're going to get a great report, a great dashboard, a great forecast, but you got to enter the data. So we're always looking to get that carrot and we get tired and our arms get tired and we don't reach for the carrot anymore. So the best way we feel is to bring them the carrots immediately, is to give them that ability to go ahead and say, well, you know what? The CRM, I can get these questions answered by using my CRM. I can know how to get more customers. I can know who my target customers are. I can identify what, what makes my customers, what makes me truly unique in their eyes. These are all things the promise of CRM is here to deliver us. But if we focus on these as opposed to data collection and data entry, we can go ahead and create processes and create strategies in order to get, that, to get the adoption it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. You need the adoption to get the good stuff, but you need the good stuff to get the adoption. So we call it customer IQ. And that's if you're focused on, especially with the sales profile, if everything you do to try to drive salesperson adoption is focused on customer IQ, this is how it helps you identify better ops within your pipeline. This is how this helps you identify leads or garbage. This is how it helps you identify uh, where, you know, what you should be selling, what's the most profitable for you, and what's the least revenue generating. Go ahead and create processes that identify that. They'll come, they'll come running to the application because that's how, they're, that's how they're wired. So how do Houdini admins succeed? You, or, uh, su succeed? You're probably, uh, everybody has secret sauce. All the, all the vendors out there, us, says, well, we've got a secret sauce. This is the best way to do it. This is how you do it. That's for you to decide. You know, some people like ketchup. My six-year-old daughter loves ketchup. I can't stand it. I love Thousand Island. She would push it off the table. She wouldn't even think about it. So everybody really, in every organization, every sales organization, every customer success organization, every organization has their own secret sauce of how to get things done. I don't know how to help your company sell your stuff and things, your widgets, right? But you instinctively, your organizations know how to do that. So the best way we feel to create your own little secret sauce is that you take something that has that, again, perceived little or no value, and you twist it around, and you give it a ways to restructure it so it does provide value to their specific process. It could be something as simple. It could be something as simple as, when I send an email, I would love to see if somebody read it immediately. Or I'd love to be notified. I'd love to have a way for a customer to directly access my Outlook calendar 
and put a meeting on there. And you're thinking, there are ways in order to do that that are attached to other apps to do a great deal of other things. But if you can go ahead and bring them that value, they'll then go ahead and do well. Now I'm getting these meetings set up for me by the customer. So now I can go ahead and have this data entered. Or I can go ahead and do this one, two, three thing, which gets the data in there. But again, you're focusing on their process. That's how you make it invisible to the user. And I understand, again, this isn't easy. This isn't something that you know, anybody says when you apply for a Salesforce admin job that this is going to be the easiest thing that you do, which is to drive user adoption. But can, what I will tell you is that as someone who has been a salesperson for over 25 years and who has invariably used a number of different CRMs, I was the most effective when I used the CRM that provided me the least level of interference and interruption of my day to day. And if my CRM admins were able to construct things, give me applications, construct some strategies and some tactics that the CRM would actually help me sell stuff and things, I was a big fan. And wouldn't it be nice if you could go back from Southeast Dreaming, you could go back to your offices, you could go ahead and institute some things, and then in a couple months you have sales reps that are just saying, hey, these were great strategies, these were great things, and I really appreciated it, and it really does help me do my job. So at the end of the day, again, it is all about how, how the user perceives what you're doing and what, and what value the actual application Salesforce brings to their day to day. You may not succeed all the time, you may have issues with adoption, there's always the laggards, there's always the people that you know, are gonna, are, you know, are gonna, I don't wanna open my computer and you could glue it shut and they'd never open it, those, those types of people. But at the end of the day, most people out there are just trying to do the job that they're being paid to do. And if you can go ahead and invest in strategy, in technology, in partnerships that can help you do that, we feel that can accomplish your main initial goal, which is driving adoption. And if you could have adoption in the you know, mid, mid, you know, low mid 90s, 90%, nine out of every 10 people utilizing all of, the, you know, all of the functions of Salesforce for your organizations, imagine then what those dashboards would look like. Imagine what those great reports would look like that you're really interested in. Imagine what those forecasts would look like, those solid forecasts and those pipeline reports and everything else. So that's really where we focus on is that. So thank you, and uh, I'm, we're available for, uh, we got a couple minutes here, we're available for questions. Anybody has questions or comments or anything regarding what we talked about? Any case studies of your own that you know, maybe the community here is interested in as far as uh, we did this and it really helped? Sure. Exactly. It's an interesting question, considering who we are. But what I will say, what I will say is, I'll be, you know, this, this, is, this isn't a commercial for us. What I will say is that you, the Salesforce community has a, un, it's unique in the, in, in, in the software community, because I've sold software for years. The Salesforce community is unique in the sense, is you have an entire uh, exchange dedicated to providing you those types of solutions where you can not only research, but you can trial and test. And so what, we've, so what I would say in, in, the, in, in the response to your question is the best way to identify that is to not ask a sales guy, because I'm gonna tell you what you know, I wanna tell you, but is to go out on the exchange and to not only take a look at reviews, but to, inter, but to integrate, is to go ahead and do trials, do pilots, take two or three people, and take, take someone who's, a, who's great at updating Salesforce and someone who you gotta t chase down with a shillelagh and get them in a pilot and see if they can use it and pilot different products. Nobody is saying you gotta dance with the one who brought you. But what we are saying is there's, like you said, there's a multitude of different products and solutions out there. So you have 
within, within the Salesforce user community, this, this again, it is a unique uh, exchange. And you have thousands of applications and companies out there. Test them out, try them out. Because the one that works best for your organization is the one that works best for your organization. And, yeah, yeah. Right. And I tell you, those, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, I, I buy a lot of stuff on Amazon, and, the, and I love Amazon reviews. It's kind of, uh, I get popcorn, and I'll read some of them, the bad ones sometimes. But the review process and the rating process on the exchange is invaluable. It takes that kind of B2C uh, business to customer mentality where I can, I can see what that, what that tent or that kayak and how it's been rated by people that purchased it before I even take a look at it. It's the same thing with those, with, with, with those, um, uh, with those reviews. And not just the star reviews, but the people that sit there and they write a paragraph or two about how the application worked or how it didn't, and then about how the company reacted to that particular review as well. So, uh, you know, there is, I, you know, I, you know, I love going on Amazon and reading the negative reviews because then it's always, you always have the, res number one, they're funny, but number two, then you have the response from the company or the seller and you identify exactly, you know, it, it's easy to make a customer happy if they're already happy, you know, but if they're not, that, you know, what do you do and what, do, and what have you changed in order to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or anybody have a story about how horrible their salespeople are or anything else you want to share? <laughs> Come on, we all know that's what you talk about when you're at these conferences. You know, it's like, oh, let me tell you, all these guys I'm working with, they're killing me, killing me. Yes? Yeah. Oh, in, it's a, th thank you so much. I, I really, LinkedIn to me is an incredible tool to take a pulse of, of, of not only a company, but of, a, but of people that do a certain type of job description. I can tell you this, we've looked on LinkedIn and we look at what Salesforce admins are writing, what they're reading, what they're looking at. And it's, it, it's invaluable for us when we're devising a product that, that services them. If you go on and you take a look at what salespeople or what customer success people are that, what articles they're looking at, what they're reading, what they're commenting on, people have that, that veil, even though it's their name and their company's on there, there's almost a little, there's still a veil of anonymity and they'll put stuff in comments that they won't tell you in a survey. They'll put stuff in comments that they will not tell you in the break room. And that's invaluable for you because then you're getting the real scoop and the real skinny. So we utilize LinkedIn like that on a regular basis where we're looking, we look at that kind of, we're crowdsourcing opinion and pulling that information out and then creating strategy behind it. Plus it's fun to read.
Well, thank you all for coming. We're, we're outside right in front of the main uh, ballroom there if you want to take a look at our little widget and what we do. But uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to present here today. And uh, since you've all been sitting here, Phil has had a system. We've, we've grabbed all your email addresses and everything else. So you'll be getting our, I'm just kidding. You're not going to get our marketing. <laughs>